And I want to introduce Paul Clark to you all here. He, um, I met him first in Shanghai in China, and he made a great impression on me because when we were in Shanghai, they never had a yellow sun anymore, it was red from pollution. And in this uh, enormous city, sort of like dystopian city of the future, Paul was keeping a lecture, uh, giving great hopes for the future, or challenging, challenging the place with his vision. And uh, uh, first, when Kari told about this seminar, uh, about information literacy, I asked myself the question, well, what kind of information will be important in the future? And how are libraries, learning centers, or communities, or schools going to work, connecting the new types of information we need to solve the challenges in the future? And one man who really reads the world in a different ways and tries to teach new curriculums to kids, to local communities, is Paul Clark. Uh, he is also the Vice Dean of the Teacher Training College, uh, St. Mary's, which is a highly acclaimed place for training teachers. Sometimes we are accused of not being in touch with reality when we train teachers. Well, Paul Clark has been traveling all over the world. He has been in the UN uh, trying to build schools after wars in Sarajevo and Somalia. Today he is used as a consultant all over the world for governments and how to create new curriculums. And uh, he's going to share one of his projects which is really close to his heart with us today. Prince Charles, I know, was there visiting him last week and the Pope is coming the week after. <laughs> <laughs> We look forward, uh, we are very honored that you have chosen to stay so many days with us, Paul, to share this project with us. So, welcome, Paul Clark. Hola, uh, good morning, bonjour. Uh, oh no, Norwegian. Come on. Hello, uh, that's about as far as I get by uh, multilingually, so. I'm delighted to be with you, and uh, thank you for sharing this week with us. I'm sorry I've not been in the meetings very often, but the times that I've met with people, it's been extremely exciting to talk to folks and to spend time with you. So hopefully this morning will be a, an opportunity to offer something back to you and um, share some of the stories that I'm involved in working on in different places, but mainly... Uh, as I put on here, because I had trouble with the computer. Um, mainly, two stories. One is a big story, the global story. In a sense, it's a grand narrative. And I know that postmodern people don't like grand narratives, but I think we have to have one, and I'll explain why. And then the other story is a very local story about things that I'm doing in the community that I live in, which is in the north of England. But we'll come to that later. Um, the first part of this talk is depressing. The second part of this talk is about hope. And uh, I think we have, in a sense, got to, got to experience the down as well as the up. Because I think there's something about letting go of a particular world view that is quite important at this, this moment. And so I'm going to show you some pictures and share some data with you that's from various sources internationally that's basically looking at the current state of our planet. If you like, it's a health check. We all go to the doctors regularly to have health checks. Sometimes, last time I went to the doctors for a health check, he told me that I was getting old. <laughs> he just said, you're no spring chicken. And uh, that was a shock, you know? Oh, how dare you say that? And then I thought, actually, he's right. I get out of bed, I feel a bit creaky. You know, my eyesight goes, so... In between this talk, I'll be moving between looking at things and then putting them down again. And I think that we, in a sense, have the same thing we have to do in our relationship with the world, with the planet. But we've forgotten to do that. And so I want to talk about that first. I want to talk about, in effect, a, a massive problem that, that we are facing globally. And it's a problem which has has come from the way we live, primarily, by the way we undertake our daily lives. It's not something individually we've decided we wanted to do, 
but collectively, as a result of the way we do what we do, we've resulted in a certain set of factors that are now looking quite significantly worrying on a planetary scale. So in a sense, I'm going to give us the health check first, and I'm going to point to some of the things which I think are critical questions as educators that we then have to ask ourselves um, and perhaps suggest to you that if we don't attend to those things, that we are very, very likely in this century to experience what's, what people like Lester Brown, who works in Washington at the World Watch Institute, um, describes as civilization collapse. It's the point at which a civilization can no longer support itself and sustain itself. And there are plenty of examples throughout human history of civilization collapse. And it happens very quickly. Um, the Mayans are one very simple example. They were there for a period of time, and all of a sudden they disappear because the environment within which they lived became sufficiently <coughs> hostile to them to not be able to support life. And we face the same thing now, I think, in our planetary perspective, um, particularly with regards to, to the type of civilization that we currently operate. So what I'm going to do is show you some pictures first about this. Uh, this is, needless to say, not civilization collapse. This is my tomato plant in my garden. Um, let's where, just, where is it? Where is the garden? In Todmonden, in Lancashire. Um, I, live in, I live on the border of Yorkshire and Lancashire. Which of these does lights? Ah, so, so we have a bit of a slideshow and I'll talk, yeah? And then the idea is that I'll give you some pictures and then we'll, we'll stop for a minute um, <coughs> and talk about it freely in the terms of literacy. What type of global literacy might we need for this type of thinking? The first picture is nothing to do with civilization collapse. It's the possibility of civilization change. And... Uh, this is the network on the United States, the cellular network for the mobile phone system. It's interesting because increasingly that's the planetary picture if you look at the, the way in which we're connecting up the planet through technology. Now, there are obvious parts of the planet where we're not touching, and it's interesting when you look at this map on a bigger scale. Certain parts of the world don't get this, and it tends to be the poorer parts of the world, but they are increasingly becoming part of that conversation. And we move towards, in a sense, a global platform that could be a conversation point for change. It could be. The question is, what's, what's this primarily used for? And primarily it's used for trade and business. And the metaphors that describe the internet and the networking and the globalization are all geared around business as usual, building the world up to be a connected place so we can do trade and industry right across it. Business as usual, as I'll explain in a minute, is no longer an option. And if we do that, we are going to go straight off the edge of a cliff. When the Copenhagen uh, conference took place last year, I was in Copenhagen for two or three days, working with some of the African countries. And if you remember, there was an interesting moment in the conference where the African countries came together and said, we're not going to tolerate a two degree Celsius rise. We are not going to sign up to that if that's what the Western countries feel is the appropriate level of tolerable change in temperature. And the reason they said that was because they recognized that two degrees Celsius would wipe them off the map. They would pretty much be left to various parts of areas like Burkina Faso in, the, in one part of Africa and a little bit of Southern Africa, but the rest of Africa would effectively become desert because of the temperature rise being so significant, it would, it would catastrophically affect their food supply. But the scientists at the same time were saying in Copenhagen, and this, this was from the, one of the nas national English papers at the time uh, during the conference, that the world is actually on course for a six Celsius rise, four degrees hotter than that which would dem devastate Africa. And that's the current state, as far as I understand it, of the, type, the direction that of consensus amongst the scientists on what the temperature rise is on climate change. It's the most profoundly dangerous time we've ever lived in as a civilization and as a, as a species. 